today on the Perception and Action podcast, Perception and Action Journal Club number 16. Are atypical movements associated with impairments like Parkinson's disease and Down syndrome flaws that need to be corrected? Or are they functional adaptations to changes and constraints? What can we learn from this that applies to sports? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I'm joined by Rajiv Raghunathan and Harjeev Singh to discuss the 1996 article, What are Normal Movements in Atypical Populations? by Latash and Anson. Are atypical movements in impaired populations actually functional adaptations to changes and constraints? Does a therapist know better than our CNS, such that we should be trying to correct these adaptations and get the movement pattern back to normal? How do these ideas apply to sports? Hope you enjoy. Okay, I think we're live. So welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Perception and Action Journal Club. Today, we have a really, really interesting paper to talk about. It uh, was a Target article from 1996 in Behavioral and Brain Sciences by Latash and Anson. And as the, the um, title shows there, it's What Are Normal Movements in Atypical Populations? And um, I think it's weird. it's a really, really interesting article. I think that has multiple <laughs> implications, not just for you know rehab or, or, or atypical populations, as we'll see. Um, also, I think at the end, we want to talk a little bit about why we don't have more <laughs> interactions like this article. Um, it's a really interesting format where you have the a target article and a bunch of commentaries. I think it's a really useful way to do it, but we'll get to that later. So I have two uh, people that you've been on the podcast before in so one way or another. But I'll, let, I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, in the middle, we have right next to me, uh, Rajiv. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Rajiv Ranganathan. I'm an assistant professor in kinesiology and mechanical engineering at Michigan State. Um, my interest is in understanding uh, motor learning with uh, applications to rehab. And you interviewed on the podcast. I don't know what number, but a while ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, a while ago. So thank you <laughs> and then we have a, 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 someone that's been on these journal clubs a couple of times before. Over, uh, the next day, I'm Harjeev. Can you introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah. Hey, so my name is Harjeev. I'm, I'm currently a PhD student here at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, my primary interest is uh, the sort of uh, characteristics of instruction and feedback that optimize motor performance and learning. Cool. Yeah. And uh, um, so let's dive right in. And, and I think it's, it's pretty evident from the title and the, what the, the central thesis of this article is. Um, but may, um, so one of them, actually, I, I thought was a good summary in, the, in the con one of the commentaries by Rich Masters. Uh, um, I'll, I'll read it. The central theme of Latash and Anse's target article seems to be that atypical motor patterns in impaired populations should not be seen as seen as abnormal, but rather as reflections of the remarkable flexibility allowed by the central nervous system and the redundancies present in the human body. In situations where movement system has been disturbed or impaired, however, this self-rule is often subjugated by the therapist who attempts to renegotiate new motor patterns in the body. So there's this idea that, you know, we're uh, maybe that the, the motor patterns that are a result of this are not abnormal and maybe we're treating them the wrong way. So I thought well, I'd start with... Um, they, they do a, a interesting start of defining what, what do we mean by normal, a uh, normal movement pattern. So kind of, what do you, what did you guys take from that? Um, it goes into some different ways to define normal. Do you, do you, um, kind of, what did you take from that discussion? Well, one thing that kind of struck, struck me, and I think it's, it's still true to a large degree, you know, it's been almost 25 years since the paper. Mm -hmm. Um, but when they talk about, you know, they sort of review the literature, you're talking about, you know, single joint movements and uh, multi-joint movements and so on. And, and before that, they say, you know, sort of without a theory, the only thing we can do is to sort of talk about regularities, right? So what, what mm -hmm. sort of things people generally tend to do. And it, it, it was just that sentence kind of struck me because it's, I think it's still true. We still, um, don't have a, you know, other than to collect lots of data on certain tasks, we don't really have a good idea of defining this in any a priori way. So it's sort of, that, that's one thing that struck me in terms of how do we define normal is we take a bunch and we take an average and that's, that's normal. 
Yeah. No, I got the same thing. Um, Rajiv, did you want to? Um, Rajiv, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, yeah. Like, it's like, uh, yeah. So I think the a really cool part about this paper was this idea of just adaptation in general. Um, I think in context, adaptation comes with like this connotation of something being negative, mm -hmm. uh, just in general. Uh, and so it, it's it's funny because um, you know even when we think about it in terms of rehab and all that, you know we we may think that you know things are adaptive in nature and whatnot. Yet we still have sort of these tests that kind of have this general sort of motor pattern that you need to reach that we test these individuals for. Um, but nonetheless, I think the paper did an excellent job in sort of uh, telling us that, hey, adaptation is something that's good um, and that it's not considered abnormal. Um, and so I think just that general, just, I mean, it's just unfortunate that, you know, 20 years later, we're still talking about sort of the same thing in terms of, oh, adaptation may be bad still uh, when it's when it's not. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I think that's the general sort of takeaway for me. Um, but uh, in that one chart, that one diagram that you'll probably put up, uh, but you, you put up on Twitter as well, um, that one was was really interesting to see um, how he kind of laid that out. So. Yeah, I mean, I can throw that one up. This, uh, yeah, very uh, provocative. Uh, the, um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a good point there. You know, I think in terms of the normal movements, I think you make they make a good point. This one here, right? <laughs> we have everything, literally everything you can have on one figure. Michael Jordan, sumo wrestler, comes each children, amputees. Right? It's pretty. Um, but I think you're right. Like normal movements are. You're right in. Um, they tend to, like I think about it in sports, you know, we talk about what an expert does. And I think yeah. one of the, there's a really good commentary, maybe master's commentary again, where they talk about that's really kind of a trendy thing that changes too over time. Like whether a two-handed backhand is the right thing to do <laughs> changes over time. And then also, you know, I think it just gets passed up through history. Like I think like if I had more time, I would love to trace back, you know, why we keep our head down when we golf right where did that come from it's just stuck in there now <laughs> like you're not getting rid of it um but does it you're right does it have any biomechanical you know justification or things like that but i think i think that's really that's really interesting um did this figure did you want to anything um i think it, it it really is like they admit it's meant to provoke <laughs> your <laughs> reaction uh, yeah. and you know things um one of the things i i really wanted to get into in this paper is that i think that well, let me get rid of all my junk sharing screen um, is the uh, issue of um, priorities, right? Yeah. Um, one of the big things that um, he points he makes is they make in the article is that when you have an injury or an impairment, it changes your priorities in terms of solving a motor control problem. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. I don't think that's something that we really think about very often. Um, in motor control, especially in sports, we always assume the only priority is achieving your goal, right? A performance priority. And we don't really talk about any of the other parts. Some, some areas of motor control do. Um, and also, I was interested, you know, what, what do you think, where, where do priorities and constraints, uh, is there, are they, are they the same thing? Or what, what are you guys' thoughts on, on this issue of priorities? Well, I, I thought the, the whole um, priorities discussion um, sort of relates to this idea of, you know, a lot of the optimization approaches, right? They, they optimize some cost function, whether it's you know, energy or effort or error or whatever, or some combination of all of these. So to me, that, that sort of immediately, uh, you know, it sort of brought me to that uh, mm -hmm. part of the control. But you're right. I mean, it's uh, other than laboratory tasks uh, to define anything outside is just, you know, uh, I haven't seen anything big uh, other than that. So it's, a, it's, again, it's a very difficult problem to understand what the priorities of the nervous system are. And then if you now add this fact that, well, they may change not only in a sort of between individuals, but also in the sense of, well, if I now have a stroke or you know, an amputation or something like that, um, it's it's just sort of uh, uh, again it points to the difficulty of what we are dealing with and and to sort of go back to your point it, it it makes sense to some extent why we rely on you know say healthy controls as the model for rehab and experts as the models in sport because we mm -hmm. uh, 
you don't have a lot else to, to rely on in any way. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, what did yeah. you take from this? Uh, I was going to put up this other figure. Uh, we were talking about this before we went on air. It, interestingly, they in the paper, they redraw the constraints <laughs> uh, triangle, <laughs> right? Yeah. They um, This figure, they put uh, priorities as one corner and the task environment constraints, which are normally two, full po- two corners all into one. Structure, I think, is still the body, right? Uh, yeah. But yeah, what what did you take from kind of the emphasis on priorities, uh, Hardy? You know, I, I originally when I read this, I thought you know priorities and constraints, so same thing. Mm-hmm. But as I as I got into the reading more, um, you know, it kind of just maybe the con- maybe constraints are the ones that sort of uh, sort of. Um, create these priorities um so uh like you know after injury or something right there's certain there's certain constraints as it comes to either the the body or or the environment that's created or whatnot and then therefore that may shift priority of the central nervous system Uh, so i thought about it both ways um I, i don't know which one is more plausible but i think um you know just thinking about it in two different lens really sort of opened up a lot of different questions that i may have but uh um, I, I do like the uh, framework here, uh, where like he kind of goes down or the diagram where like he goes down to control parameters. Um, I've always been a fan of like control parameters and order parameters and all that. Um, so it's, it's really cool how that sort of, um, uh, sort of flows. And I actually redrew this in my notebook with using the constraints letter model, <laughs> um, and then the same thing with control parameters and moving parameters. So, I mean, to me, it, it can go both ways, but I, I do think maybe constraints shape the priorities of, of the central nervous system. Uh, but uh, that's just kind of thinking on top of my head. So, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think sort of maybe to add, add to that, um, yeah. one thing they, they uh, sort of get criticized a little bit for is to kind of, you know, they, they adopt a dynamical systems sort of framework when they talk about nervous system does X and Y. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and so to me, the priorities seemed like a, a way to sort of merge the two. You have the constraints that force some change in priorities, and then that sort of results in the movement pattern. So to me, the, the priorities are a intermediary if you're thinking about something doing the, the control. Yeah, I had the same reaction. I, the priorities kind of kept bringing up very non-ecological, yeah. type, like it, it's almost like weighting, uh, putting weights to things, which is not a eco- uh, dynamical systems idea. It's almost there's also this idea that I, they really push throughout the paper that you almost have I don't know what words to use for this. The top down, I'll use this top down constraint of your goal you're trying to achieve, and almost these bottom up ones of your body fighting against you, right, and not letting you do what right. you want to to be. And, and in a lot of the examples he gives with atypical movements, he, he they argue that that part, that bottom up or whatever you want to call it, is kind of overactive. It's like preventing people from getting injured and moving quickly and, and things. Right. Whereas in normal more normal people, we can fight through that. <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting idea too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the for me the, the the constraint the difference between the constraints. So constraints are almost always we talk about them in task goal related terms. Like we don't really ever talk about efficiency or minimizing yeah. energy or avoiding injury when we talk about constraints, right? We always talk about I'm, I don't know if they're in there. What Do you think you can yeah. fit this concept within the constraints um, you got? Or is this, this idea of prioritizing these different sub-goals? I don't know what you call them either. <laughs> well, I, I do think you're right. I mean, priorities sound like the goal of the task, um, if we were to just kind of look at it that way. But, um, you know, using the constraints load approach, it's, you know, maybe – you know, maybe we have, well, I wouldn't say that, but yeah, I, I, I probably think of it as, you know, maybe the priority is our goal. Um, and then the constraints from the constraints that approach that model sort of, uh, gets us to that priority. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's, uh, it will like, like, like what you said, I mean, it's, it, they kind of mix together top down, bottom up, and it's kind of like they use sort of, 
dynamical systems terms, but then used a lot of pre-programming uh, in this paper. And so like, it was kind of like, I don't know which way to go really, but I do understand where you're trying to come from. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, the sort of, again, uh, the, the task goal itself, um, like we've been having this discussion on another paper, but this sort of idea of, well, the, you know, people usually think of task goal in the sort of very short term time scale, right? Okay. You're like, if I'm whatever, playing a tennis forehand, the task goal is to whatever, get it over the net. Yeah. Um, but then you can think about these goals in longer time scales, right? Of course, I wanted to get it over the net, but then, you know, I want to maybe position the player and the, uh, the opponent in a, disadvantages position and then you can think about well then i want to implement this strategy and then this sort of like you say injury prevention is a very very long time scale thing it doesn't sort of mm -hmm. play a role at the level of a single forehand but yeah now if i have to practice a million of those well now that sort of fits in in a much longer time scale so that i think the nesting of the task goals then brings about this idea that um, you can have priorities that are task goals essentially mm -hmm. that you have set but are not maybe reflected in a sort of very short snapshot of the task. Yeah, I think that's a, that's an interesting way to think about it in the time scale. Um, um, the closest thing I, I you know I have that when I work with um, baseball players, sometimes of people, sometimes a, a issue that I work with baseball batters is their follow through. So they follow through and they only use their arm or something, which is really. Um, a chance for injury <laughs> um, if you don't follow through the whole body. But the thing that I always try to sell them on is, you know, your body is not going to let you accelerate as fast as possible if you don't have a plan for deceleration <laughs> coming up, right? So it does. It, that's kind of what the feeling I, I close as I can think of to where I get to this. This your body almost has these other priorities inherent in yeah. it that you have to satisfy, or it's not going to let you just do anything. Um, right. Yeah. So I don't. And, and that sort of gets yeah. uh, gets at their point, right? Yeah. The, the sort of most provocative assumption they start with is like, you know, we, we assume that we know more about motor control than the. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That. Uh, well, I love that. Yeah, they, got, they got some pushback in the end for that, but I think it's a. Uh, it's. I mean, I, I I sort of agree with them to a, to a, to a large extent on that. Is we yes, we know some things that the nervous system may not know on a very short time scale, but. Uh, a lot of these things, like you said, you know, if, if you don't have the movement pattern to slow down or if you don't have the strategy to slow down, well, it's not going <laughs> to let you speed up. I think it's a great example of that. Yeah. You know, on, on that sense, I keep thinking about like sporting examples and, um, you know, I think they may have mentioned it a little bit, but like things like fatigue, for example, how does that shift priorities uh, if it does, right? Or uh, things like... Uh, you're not playing well or, on, you know, they mentioned under pressure, I think at one point, Oh no, that was, the, that was a master's commentary where they talked about pressure, but you know, is there like a way where, you know, you can with under these specific environmental or task constraints that all of a sudden your priorities will shift because of certain physiological uh, sort of uh, patterns, which is also interesting. Cause I, I tell you when I'm playing, uh, when I'm really, really tired, there's things that I won't even do because I'm just really tired. Uh, so, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Right. No, I think that's a good point. And yeah, I think this, it also gets into a lot of like what an optimal, like you were talking about, what an optimal movement pattern is. And I think it, again, it adds a little extra layer to it. I think we often, like the definition I use when someone asks me is the movement pattern that achieves the best performance given the ta individual constraints and task constraints, right? So it's different. Yeah. There's not one. Um, but notice, it, like, it, that's just focused on performance, <laughs> right? Um, it, it doesn't have these other priorities that um, they, they emphasize. So, yeah, maybe we can get into, so if we think about, I know they started talking about things like Parkinson's disease, you know, um, tremors and things. And you're right, they started to get in some pre-programming ideas. But kind of what did you take, like, uh, was there one kind of example that they gave of a, a particular condition or thing that, um, you know, thought was a good illustration of this idea? Did you guys? Yeah, I, I thought the the whole idea of uh, of bradykinesia, right? So moving moving slower than normal and and sort of treating that as um, an adaptation uh, to some so to say deficits in pre-programming. I thought I thought that was a, a really neat idea, and I I think I mean some some people in the in the commentaries push back on that, saying this is not not simply an adaptation. But I think I remember. Um, paper maybe 
10 years ago or something like that, where they were looking at speed accuracy trade-offs in, in Parkinson's and, and show that it, it's not really a, a movement issue. It's sort of like a reward type of issue. They don't, yeah. they can, you can, if you push them, they'll, they can move fast, um, push them meaning sort of metaphorically, mm-hmm. not physically, but um, in, uh, it, it sort of reflected the idea that it's not necessarily moving slow. That's the problem. It's actually a reflection of something else that's going on. And that's why, uh, they're moving slower. I was surprised. I, I didn't know. Like, again, when you, when you read papers again, you mm-hmm. have some new knowledge that, that you're <laughs> referring to. So I, I sort of immediately was struck by the comparison to that paper that came out a, a few years ago that showed exactly that. Yeah. Right yeah. Here. And there's yeah. a, a part there. There's a part in there that uh, triggered. I thought you would like Karji, especially because they get at the point of understanding instructions right in words like yeah. what oh, does it God. what does it mean to move as fast as possible yeah. right <laughs> uh, i thought that was interesting did you catch did you get that yeah, part? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wrote a whole page on that so uh, <laughs> pretty much uh i love i loved how they brought it up because even in parkinson's disease actually there's a quite a few papers on the usage of action verbs uh and how action verbs actually help people with Parkinson's disease because of their low levels of dopamine, I think it is. Uh, so it's this idea of using specific words that can help. And there, I think it was one paper that actually showed this, um, that their uh, uh, movement time was quicker with, uh, um, again, I don't remember the sort of task, but with the usage of action verbs, they were quicker. But now uh, at the same time, I think the these, this instructions that they um, talk about, I think they did a really, really good job in um, in sort of, uh, you know, delineating, like, you know, get to the target as fast as possible versus, you know, initiating the movement as quickly as possible and how that kind of shapes the movement solution or the way you actually go about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, I think they had mentioned um, – something along the lines of, you know, distal to proximal, proximal to distal. Um, that was really interesting because I don't think a lot of, um, a lot of studies have looked into that per se. I mean, a lot of the atten- there's been a lot of attention or a couple of papers in attention that have looked at sort of, you know, kinematics and all that, but not more than that. And kind of, we just kind of stopped there. Um, so I think that was interesting. And, and at the same time, um, you know, to, to the point made earlier, uh, while I haven't worked with any of these population, um, I spent some time with spinal cord injury and cerebral palsy and kind of just working in those uh, populations. Um, it, it's really fascinating how um, just the rules, like, like I said, the constraints, like the rules, the environment and all that um, really shape how uh, motor behavior is sort of done. So, for example, cerebral palsy, uh, we use like uh, constraint-based therapy, uh, which is pretty pretty normal, uh, sorry, pretty popular. Uh, and just by, you know, restricting their non-affected hand, they were still able to, you know, do certain movements. Um, and, uh, you know, there may have been a difference in how we cued things here and there. And I think that plays a huge role, but, um, to the point of this just general, you know, talk about atypical populations um the idea of adaptation and, and the environment and you know i always say um and i, and I made this comment in uh, sean's conference earlier and I, and I said you know uh there's a possibility that language actually structures space and how we actually go about our environment um and that's i mean if you fall if you go down into the rabbit hole of like more cognitive psychology work, um, you'll see the work of like prepositions and all that and how that affects, you know, just how we view our environment around us. So um, I think that, I think when they hit on that, I got really happy because that was, that was really interesting. Uh, and we don't really pay attention to that. And so, yeah. Uh, one, one other thing that sort of struck me um, is how, you know, how, you may give the same instruction, but, you know, different individuals sort of yeah. perceive the environment differently. Right? They were talking about um, some populations being, like, afraid of breaking the equipment when they're, mm-hmm. when they're in the experiment. And, and it just sort of, again, points out, like, you know, I've, I've, I've been a, a participant in a few experiments, and, and clearly there's differences between, you know, in one case, the, you know, the wires are all going everywhere, and you're, like, you know, even mm-hmm. scared to put a finger anywhere, and then there's others which are, like, really neat and clean, and then you don't have to worry about anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's sort of like we treat those as as nuisance variables, yeah. right? We don't really think that can affect anything. But if if what what Latash and Anson say here is uh, true, which I think is 
fruit is partly. Mm-hmm. Um, these these have a huge influence on what kind of results you get from different labs, right? I mean, how how yeah. the environment is structured, how the you know the, the particular you know whether you have weight support, whether you don't have weight support. I mean, all these variations can create a, a huge problem in trying to identify even what the problem is. If, you know, laboratories differ and how they yeah. implement these. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And uh, I always say that you know, I learned like coming from a visual perception background, I, I I kind of, we in our lab, we had a, I call it a healthy distrust of verbal instructions because we didn't trust, when I say judge the distance of that thing on the screen, I didn't trust that you would do that. Like I yeah. designed the experiment so that if you weren't doing that, <laughs> I would know. If you were judging the size of it instead, it would show up in the pattern results. Cause you're right. People can interpret things in so many different yeah. ways. And, and, and it's, um, so yeah, I thought that was a really interesting point. So I think their overall point they're making is maybe we're not, we're, we're using the wrong standard of what a, a good movement is in that, right? We're, we're assuming they're, it's this, <laughs> that they're yeah. treating this as the main priority in the instruction when maybe they're not. So it's not really a, it's a goal difference, not a, a motor issue. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it sort of goes back to the, you know, like mm-hmm. the dynamical idea of, you know, you don't want to treat the system as a blank slate, right? But, mm-hmm. but in experiments we do because we say, well, this is the only thing that's varying. Everything else is mm-hmm. the, the same. Yeah. And especially if you're comparing different populations, that, blank slate thing could be horribly wrong uh, in terms of making that assumption. I remember um, there was this discussion a few years ago, I I can't remember who who said it, but this idea of, like, you know, take the simplest task in the laboratory, which is to match, uh, you know, make a constant force, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we do it with young adults, you do it with older adults, older adults show greater variability. Well, that's sort of almost universal. But then you think about, well, is it because they're really more variable or is it because you know, for them, a little bigger error, they're fine with it, right? I mean, they mm-hmm. they don't have to necessarily, you don't have to, there's no reason why they should have the same sort of error tolerance as the younger adults. And so if you sort of bring that in, well, that could change the whole picture of whether they're actually more variable or whether they're just comfortable sort of like, you know, this error is good enough kind of mentality. So it's a, it sort of raises a lot of yeah. issues. Yeah, I think that those are great points and, you know, goals and incentives and, you know, yeah. We, um, I always, I had the similar, like in a lot of the pressure studies I did, um, one of the things we found was with expert, um, you know, we tried to make people fail under pressure. And we just add competitive pressure to experts, yeah. they get better because they were bored with my study before. They didn't care. Like, you're making me putt on this little mat. I don't care how well I do. Oh, you had money now. <laughs> right? yeah. So we I say, you know, social pressure was way more effective. But, but I think you're right. Sometimes we take for granted these. And I think that, that idea of priorities really captures yeah. it. Um, but yeah, I think so. That, I think that that's a good example. The other one is they seem to um get out again is this one i mentioned where i think they describe a, a like a movement as a perturbation of the system that your body there's almost this homostasis mechanism that it's going to try to <laughs> correct like this compensation and i think you know i think maybe tremors was an example of they thought that was kind of overcompensation right this yeah. it's trying to you're moving and it's trying to uh, cor- correct and keep you stable or, but you know, if, uh, I counteract. Did, did you get guys get? Um, is that? Did you get that kind of same um, idea yeah. in reading it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I, I think maybe related to that was the idea of again, if you sort of, sort of since things happen in time, where the constraint occurs may not really be where you see the difference. And so they give this uh, analogy of like a downhill skier, right? There's, mm-hmm part of the trajectory that's sort of very difficult, but people will change both the trajectory you know, uphill to that and downhill to that. And so that uh, that sort of analogy, and I think the example they gave was in the, in the Parkinson's maybe, mm-hmm. they're talking about if I had difficulties in slowing down, then I would start off slow. I wouldn't like speed up and then make lots of errors. I would start off. Slow. You might think my deficit is in preparation, but it's really because it's driven by this constraint that's mm-hmm. going to come up later which is i can't stop as well yeah no nope. yeah so you agree no sorry yeah i agree yeah, yeah. That was, no i wow. think that's a great point i was going to raise that too that you know localizing that's another issue localizing the exact deficit um 
you know, in, in the non-linear, if we really believe it's a non-linear complex system, yeah. um, the, um, you know, is, is really, you know, is, is really difficult. And it's a huge assumption you make that, that the deficit, where the deficit occurs, what, where the effects going to be is, you right. know, is a really kind of flawed <laughs> assumption, right? Um, the, I, I used to always talk about this in class when we talked about le- lesion studies, um, you know, uh, my example I gave is if you if you took a radio or, or, or any kind of electronics and opened it up and smashed a part of it and it started buzzing, what was the job of that part to prevent buzzing in the first place? Right? Right? It's a nonlinear effect you've caused by damaging one part of the system. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really good point this this paper makes as well. Um, yeah. And then the other one was I thought was kind of interesting was the down down syndrome. Uh, case. Um, I thought that was a bit different. Um, they are almost trying to s- talk about the cognitive mental deficits and, and put it in with the motor deficits. So what, did you guys right. get the kind of same? Um, what do yeah. you think about that? Or do you, did you? I, I think, I think it, it, it brought up a good point because when we work with these atypical populations, they do have, they do have these mental deficits that obviously the normal uh, populations don't. Um, and so I, I liked how they brought that up and how, you know, that there is sort of a, a framework in which both of them are, you know, it's just hard to study, I think, at the end of the day, right? That's one thing is like, you know, they have a mental deficit, but then you're also trying to, uh, you know, optimize their motor sort of patterns. Um, how do you how do you go about that? And what do you compare that to? Um, and so I think at the end, they actually uh, made a... Um, a suggestion for a study. I don't know if that was in Down syndrome or not, but I mean, um, yeah. I mean, otherwise, I do. Uh, what I would say is that you know, this this idea of, of when you work with atypical populations, this mental deficit. Um, I, I was kind of, uh, I kept thinking about how I would design a project or how, I, and I was kind of troubled uh, thinking about that. But uh, yeah, I think there's you know, there's a brain and behavior connection, right? We talk about it all the time. So that needs to be um, somehow figured out and, and stuff like that. But um, I liked what they did. Um, that's for sure. Uh, bringing those two together. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I thought. I mean, that that whole discussion um, to me, it felt like we we can't really study these things as one shot studies, or you know, it's like oh, in this condition, A differs from B is not going to be terribly informative. Mm-hmm. Less really, or you know, like you know, to, to sort of go to their language. If you want to really understand the priorities of of the nervous system, whether it be typical or atypical, you really have to kind of you know sort of scan the whole landscape, and only then could you even have some idea of what really the, the potential deficit is. Um, and you know, sort of again, the, the res- you know the results are the results that are fine, but I think you know what these sort of issues seem to point out is. Well, what do these results really mean? Uh, can you know is is really really difficult if you just have a very very sort of small snapshot of what they can do, um, and not know whether it's because you know whatever they're afraid of breaking the equipment or mm-hmm. you know, other things. And, and of course, nobody probes for that level of robustness in, in terms of the results. Yeah, no, I think those are the very, one of the interesting parts of this to me was to th- this was another area where they seem to be mishmashing. Uh, different theories, uh, yeah. like more uh, inf- information processing diamonds. And for me, I don't know if you got the same, read it the same way, but I, th- I thought they were arguing that one of the reasons, um, Down syndrome p- patient people tend to move slowly, more slowly is they can't use information to correct their movements. Um, they, they, because of the processing deficit they're not going to once i start moving i'm not going to be able to correct it like a normal uh, person can so i'm not going to move as quickly um i'm going to be more conservative in my movement and things like that um to me i don't know how that that's kind of like because we, normally we don't think about online control and regulation as being a thing that requires a lot of mental capacity or cognitive right so i thought that was an interesting me that did i was got me thinking a lot i didn't know if quite the explanation worked I mean, I don't know if you guys did, did. Did you get that same read it the same way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the the theoretical framework at, at some point. I think like in the reply to the commentaries, they say 
yes, you know, we, we sort of mix languages here, mm. uh, but they, they sort of make the statement that, you know, sort of at, at our current state of knowledge, um, you know, it's not clear to us that it makes a difference whether we state it in theory <laughs> X or theory Y. And I, I thought that was a fair point in the mm. sense of, mm-hmm. yes, we have, you know, people who are sort of strictly on, on one theory, but, but I think the overall point is uh, how you actually describe it, whether in terms of perception action or whether in terms of information processing. I think the, the, the fundamental point they're trying to basically, basically get at is if I'm, I'm, I'm going to make more errors at the end for fast move mm-hmm. then the optimal strategy is to slow down right from the start. Yeah. So that's, that's how I kind of view it. Uh, but yeah, you're right. And that, mm-hmm. that's a mismatch in terms of... Yeah. Uh, how do you did it? No, I, I agree. And I, and I agree with your previous point about like uh, the shift in priorities uh, when you have like this sort of mental deficit. Um, I, I just keep thinking in terms of practical, like, you know, if you're a, a teacher or, or a rehab professional working with these individuals, you know, if you have a shift in, if you do know that they come with mental sort of deficits, how, how do you go about, you know, uh, basically, you know, uh, like doing that and worrying about that as well as the the goal of maybe you know making them slow quicker or whatever in terms of their reaching times and stuff like that i just kept thinking about how I, if i was a clinician how would i how would i do that as a is i know they come with these mental deficits you know it's Mm-hmm. I couldn't think of anything, so I was just, you know, I, I just, it's, it's it's actually really interesting to me because we don't, um, as mentioned, we don't, we, you know, we may, I think these priorities shift uh, for the individual, but at the same time, as well as for the coach or the rehab professional, has to understand that these priorities do shift, and it's not the same priority for every single person that they get. I guess that's a better way to put it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I just kept thinking about how how would I do it? And I just didn't think of anything. So Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can turn to that. I think that's one of the really interesting things of this paper, right? They're uh making the point not only that these, you know, these may not be these may they may be adaptable uh, responses, but that then like I said, the courts the they, we tend to subjugate them by trying to change them. Um like I think the, the example I like they gave was, you know, if you have a Down syndrome child that runs with a really short stride length of putting markers yeah. on the ground to make them have a, nor- a normal stride length. <laughs> like, so you really, co- you're, and we do this in therapy, we, we instruct to form instead of function, right? We're trying to get back the form we're looking for and the movement we're looking for, assuming that's the best way to get to functions, but um, maybe not anymore. I think that's the, their, their point in this new situation the person has. So um, what are your thoughts? You know, you do, you know, some you know, research on rehab and, and things around you. What does this kind of uh, you think makes you think about when, you, when you're talking about, you know, what do we do here? You're right. Hard is right. It's such a difficult problem. Yeah. But what, you know, what, well, what are your thoughts on that? I, I thought a lot of the commentaries sort of got to a sort of convergent point. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those were mainly from, you know, the, the therapist's sort of pushback on, on this idea is, is I think most of them said, well, you're kind of creating a straw man here in the sense that we're not necessarily trying to make movement patterns go back to normal, but rather we're trying to restore function. And, and so um, they sort of push back at this idea that, yes, some of these things may be adaptations, but if these adaptations interfere in some way with your function, then it doesn't matter if it's the primary source or the adaptation, you know, we need to fix it in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, I think the, the Konzak and, and Dishkan's a commentary had something like, you know, like, let's say it's stooped posture. That's, you know, maybe it's an adaptation, maybe it's a primary deficit, but, you know, that's going to affect your ability to interact in a social context. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, this, this to me is one, one of those things that makes rehab somewhat different from the sporting context is because um, in the rehab context, you're, you're not only trying to optimize function, but also these other constraints or priorities, whichever you want to call it, of, well, I don't want to walk in a way that, you know, or may not walk, walk in a way that people start looking at me uh, when I walk in a room. Right? So I, so it might be that I'm willing to say, 
walk a little bit slower as long as I'm symmetric, you know, something like that, because then you know, we're less likely to be noticed. So I think that was some an important point that that came out in the in the commentaries, uh, which I thought is really interesting because, um, again, especially in the rehab context, it's not simply performance that matters. Um, and and I think you know even in the sort of common sense observation of you look at say, how pitchers throw or they're, you know, people who throw a submarine or whatever. Mm-hmm. And everybody's fine because, you know, they don't know they're just doing it on on the field. But when you now say apply it to locomotion or reaching and then somebody has a very, very atypical pattern of doing something, uh, then it could be, again, some individuals at least may not want to do something like that. So it's a sort of additional layer of complexity, I think, that's um, important to recognize. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. Yeah, I, I got that. Yeah, it's it's almost you know we we always talk about this wonderful degeneracy and we can solve things in a million different ways. But you're right, there are these social norms of form, right, beyond function, right? That that are kind of yeah, you you might be able to run walk like that, but you're going to get a lot of looks and you know people right. teasing you if you're a kid, and so. Right, the, uh, you know, I think we could conceptualize those as just a different type of task constraints, right? Yeah, not just beyond with the normal ones we think of. Um, they're they're kind of social constraints. Yeah, and I think that's a really that's a really interesting issue. Hard? Did, did you want to? I saw yeah. you. <laughs> I think in rehab um, in general, and this is where I kind of like the optimal theory mm-hmm. uh, because it kind of. Uh, you know, really hones into the, the person and the person we're working with, um, you know, making the task easier, for example, giving positive feedback. I mean, these things that we uh, don't necessarily uh, kind of take for granted and don't necessarily think about uh, have a drastic effect. And I know it's fairly new and, and you know, we're concurrently conducting studies. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see that being applied to more of the atypical populations um, and to see how, you know, that affects, you know, I mean, I, I, would, I could imagine someone with Down syndrome, <clears throat> you give them a choice to do like, I mean, that I think to them that would be pretty, pretty fun. And it would kind of make, you know, rehab more fun and kind of evidently sort of, uh, you know, impact their performance. And so I'm curious to see it being applied now to the more atypical populations. But um, that type of framework, I think, is important because, again, it may shift your priorities, like we've talked about. Um, and um, and that's I think that's important, um, for, at least for the clinician's end of things um, to understand. So, yeah. No, I think that, that those are good points, and I think um, you know I think it's it's really important. And I think uh, uh, another point that I I got out of a few, couple of the commentaries was, you know, we we can't take for granted the kind of the time pressure. This is both on coaches and therapists, right? This uh, idea of allowing people to adapt in any old way it it, it takes time. Versus the best I have is these patterns I know work for most people. So right. I'm going to try teaching right. them to you in the really small amount of time I have with you. So I think we have to be careful sometimes to recognize the practical constraints <laughs> on coaches and, and, and therapists, right? We, you know, we push these theories, but you know, if you want to get result looking good <laughs> and, you know, sometimes that, that's a, that's an important issue as well. Uh, I think the other point that, that um, I think it's in the car and shepherd commentary, that, that I think is an interesting point is, um, they, they sort of say, well, you can't really call this adaptive if it does not have the flexibility to adapt to different contexts or to, or to real life, right? So it's, it's, yes, it's different, but it's not adaptive in any sense because, well, it, it sort of, there's a sort of restriction in the movement repertoire to some extent. So it's not the same problem as the, you know, saying this, this was, or works for, Typical individuals, this is just the same thing, but for atypical individuals, it's not really the same thing anymore. I think that's uh, another point because then that goes to this idea of why we need you know, strength training or all these other things because well, you're also trying to expand uh, the movement repertoire rather than just accept whatever comes as, well, this is the best for them. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I got the same kind of... Uh, a couple of the times, I don't know if they... I think they may have said this explicitly that you get the idea of Bernstein's idea of freezing, 
degrees of freedom in, in this. So you're right on the technically that is solving the movement problem adaptively, but it's a really low level <laughs> of adaptation, yeah. right? It's really inefficient, bare minimum <laughs> solution you're coming up with rather than being coming up with some, you know, really, well, I don't think the word when we say adaptable, we really, that comes to mind. Um, right. the things, yeah. Yeah. Is there any other kind of main points that we missed or anything that we, um, I don't think, um, I know they, t they went into a little bit about, um, kind of brain plasticity and reorganization. And, um, if you read the article, they really get specific about some of the motor commands and all, and all that. I think uh, they, they do, do a good job of, they really bring a lot of different things together, um, in, the, right. in this paper from, you know, rehab, neuropsychology, <laughs> motor control, you know, so I think that should be commended. Yeah. Um, did you guys have any, any other things you I mean, missed you can think of or? I, I thought, I mean, one, one other thing yeah. that, that stuck out is um, in the, in the, the Goldberger Mayer commentary, they, they have this nice line. I, I thought was a, they said, the goal of rehab is not to normalize, but to functionalize, which is sort of, I think, a nice way of mm -hmm. seeing the response is it's not really, not really sort of, uh, you know, creating the straw man of we're going to push the regular movement pattern on everybody, but we want to want to see what, what works in terms of uh, achieving their function. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Klatsky article, I think also, um, but it, go, it goes back to that figure one you had in the sense of well, everybody's always reprioritizing, you know, yeah. you think of, mm -hmm. you know, baseball pitcher, you know, sort of tossing a stone or whatever. They're not going to throw it in their mm -hmm. you know, baseball pitching motion. They're just going to whatever, chuck it under hand. Um, it's, uh, it, so everybody's really reprioritizing whether you're thinking about it, in the skilled athletes, whether it's development, you know, Again, if a child can't walk very stably, well, then it adopts a wide stance and sort of models mm -hmm. a bit. Um, and so the, they say the real difference here is simply one of time scales because you know, if you had, say, a, a brain injury of some sort or, or you know, something big happening, well, the, the real prioritization is just happening mm -hmm. over a much longer time scale than what we typically see. So it, I thought was, it's fit very nicely with their figure one is everybody's really reprioritizing. <laughs> Yeah, um, but just across different time scales. Yeah, that really uh, hit home with me too. And the, the limited work I've done, a little bit of work I've done on injury. One of the when I talk about it, one of the points I like is I don't like the word rehab and recovery because they imply going back right to somewhere you were before. And the quote I always use is the fame, you can never step in the same river twice, right? Yeah. Right. We're always adapting, adjusting. You can't ever go back. There's no back <laughs> um, um, to where you were before. And I, so that's what that kind of uh, rang for me. Um, th that, that figure really, I think made that point, but and I think the time scales one is another, another one, uh, going back to what you said earlier about, um, you know, sometimes that's where a coach has to send a step in, a lot of times and prioritize the injury prevention, right? Cause that's a long time scale thing that most athletes are not going to care about, <laughs> uh, especially if they're, if they're performing well. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. Oh, we lost RG fell out here. Um, the last thing, you know, I mentioned, um, well, here he comes back. We lost you there for a sec. <laughs> um, did you have something you wanted to say about that or are you? Uh, no, no, I think, so I think on the notion of time skills, uh, they, they did, they did mention something really interesting about, uh, structure versus function. And I think, you know, we hit on that as well, but, uh, there was one thing I wrote down, um, they said even with no redundancy in the control variables, there's still maybe redundancy in choosing time patterns for task variables. And I think that was really important, um, especially when it comes to understanding this, uh, this paper in general. Uh, but. Yeah, I mean, that, that's for, I think you guys hit the nail on the head with that. Yeah. I think that's a good point. That's such a tricky thing to study yeah. <laughs> things at multiple time scales, but you're right. It is so important. Um, I guess the last thing I wanted to uh, mention, uh, I think if there was any, I think we hit on a lot of the commentaries. I don't know if there's any other one. Uh, my, my favorite, of course, is the one I mentioned a couple of times, Masters one, because he talks about sports. Um, and then I'll read a paragraph. In, in conclusion, we must agree with Latash and Anson's contention that in a typical population, the CNS should be left unfettered to play its role in defining motor patterns. We wish, however, to broaden the sweep of their argument to take it not only to populations with 
disorders, but also populations in which, in which the required movement patterns are somehow atypical, e.g. sports, <laughs> which I like. Allow, allow for variability and redundancy, yeah, which, you know, I think we all preach. Uh, so that, I love that, uh, that comment there. Um, I guess the last thing we wanted to mention, you know, these, we, I mentioned at the start, this type of article, um, you were, you, you, I saw you, t you tweet about, uh, this uh, a couple of days ago, Raj. You, you, what was your kind of thoughts on, on this, uh, this format of yeah, the I mean, target art? I, yeah. I just was like, you know, going through the article, sort of preparing a little bit for today. And, and it was so nice to have everything in one place, right? You've got, um, because usually it's sort of like the typical way reviews work. You, you submit something and then, you know, reviewers come back and say, Hey, what about X? What about Y? And then, you know, the authors don't want to take that worldview because it's sort of, it's not their preferred worldview. And I think this sort of solves that problem because at first target article, the authors are just free to express what they want in whatever framework they want. But then the, the, the commentators get to say, Hey, you sort of didn't look at this or you didn't look at that. And it's, it's all in one place. And then, the authors get to respond and, you know, and then we can sort of judge whether they did a good job or not. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's such a nice place to have, you know, I, to me, this is what a review article should do, right? I mean, we always advise students to go read reviews and, and this is, you know, exactly what you want. You want to know what the strengths are, what the weaknesses are, and that sort of then shape your ideas on what experiments to do next or whatever. I thought it's just a um, you know, brilliant format. I, I just can't, I still don't understand why it's not popular. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, uh, RG, did you want to jump in there with it? Yeah. You know, as, as a student, um, I, I do agree. I would rather write and read these types of articles than have to write and read it and write and read like really, really long, sort of not to the point, but like, you know, it's and these are just more like straightforward right to the point like you know you read it and get it done with like you it makes sense you know otherwise it's like you see yourself going all different directions trying to figure out what this means what that means and like they you know they may attempt to sort of make it clear but it's just not it's just not there and i think you know in terms of writing a review paper i think that i would always choose this type of format unfortunately in the circumstances we live in uh, this type of format is not you know, the conventional format as a late, so. <laughs> yeah, and, and to me, the other sort of feeling I have is like, currently the only way you respond, let's say there's a big review article, but you say, well, oh, they missed out on this X and this doesn't fit. You have to write like a letter to the editor, right? And yeah. I don't know, sometimes it feels confrontational almost. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this format completely removes that because they know there are going to be commentaries at, at the end. So it sort of removes that stigma of, hey, you know, I'm going to write to the editor. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so those don't know you, when you do this, you write the article firsthand, you submit it, and then you usually list a, a bunch of names of people for the editors yeah. to ask for comments. Then they submit them, and then you can respond. So, yeah, and you, I like it because also, it, you know, we always bug, we always hammer students for writing you know, lit reviews that they just summarize things and they don't yeah, yeah. integrate or challenge the area. And but we don't hold ourselves to that standard too often, right? We have these reviews where there's not, whereas if you write one of these, you have to kind of be like this. I think this is a great example because they're, they push the line of way beyond what you normally write in scientific right. writing sometimes to deliberately, like that first figure we showed with Michael Jordan is deliberately meant to provoke and get people. Yeah, yeah. I really like that a lot. And and like, and maybe, yeah. maybe even not like all reviews. I mean, yeah. some, some reviews, I guess, are necessarily historical, mm -hmm. but, but like review papers, which sort of bring together some new synthesis, something, I think those should always be in this format because then everybody has a sense of, okay, this is where the thing is. This is where the deficiencies mm -hmm. are. Let's yeah. go and test them. Seems like that would be the yeah. most efficient way to organize these, these papers. Yeah, and I agree with you. You get these comments that either people wouldn't be willing to, because they don't. You don't want to be confrontational. Like the one I kept mentioning, Masters one. It's basically agreeing, <laughs> and then adding a bunch of other examples right. and spins on it. He would never. You never write a letter to the editor where he disagree agree with everything. Yeah. <laughs> right? well, it wouldn't get published probably. You don't just agree and say that's a great. Where you know. Um, so, so sometimes positive. We always we always want to be critical and negative when we review things, yeah. and sometimes there's not room for that positive. 
I think that. And, and it, it seems like even even in this journal, right? I mean, there mm-hmm. were there were a few. I know there was one like on Fitz Law and mm-hmm. one on like the perceptual basis. I think there's there, there's a couple in like early two thousand and. I don't know. I haven't seen any big motor ones mm-hmm. after that, which sort of makes me sad because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Point, yeah, more people publishing in this journal because it'd be really yeah. nice. Yeah, I was saying, I was saying before we went on the air, if you want another really good example, there's not motor ones. Yeah, is um, we were talking about Chaz Firestone's one on. Um, where he argues there's no top-down influences on perception, which is a really <laughs> bold statement uh, that really contradicts, seemingly contradicts a lot of research. Um, and, and that one got a lot of discussion going and things. I thought that was another great example. So it doesn't, you're right, it doesn't fit for everything. You want it to be some somewhat uh, not really novel twist. You're pushing something new, yeah. um, not just... You know, I believe in self-organization. <laughs> you know, I can write one like that, but I don't think that's really controversial anymore. Um, um, maybe the last thing I wanted, you know, um, before we sign on, we have a couple more. minutes. I asked you guys what, what's going on. Uh, Harji, I, I, we were talking before. You just finished the um, the motor control uh, summer school. Yeah. 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 So for people that are anyone interested, yeah. I just wanted can you tell us what's that about and how, your experience with that? Yeah, so um, the Motor Control Summer School is pretty much um, by the International Society for Motor Control, and uh, I've been going. I, I've been two times already. Uh, I went to Brazil, and then I went to uh, the one in Pennsylvania, and it's run by Mark, uh, Dr. Latash, and and uh, a few others. So yeah, Dr. Latash, Mindy Levin, um, Dr. Anto Feldman, so they and Dr. Greg Schoner. So you know, pretty big names in terms of uh, motor control and. It's uh, this year. This year it's virtual, so it, it is free. Um, so definitely check that out if you can. It's just a lecture series by all these people, um, and uh, otherwise, typically you have to apply for it and make your way there. But uh, it's a, it's a great way to not only ne- not only network with you know really um, amazing sort of uh, professionals and professors, but also as a student, I think, you know, just to get a better understanding of these different types of uh, ideas that are being thrown out there. I mean, you have one-on-one time with these, you know, individuals. So it's, it's a little different. Um, and so if you're interested in motor control at all um, and the work like of this that we just went over, I think it's uh, it's a really special place to be. Um it uh, takes about three days, I think three days of all, pretty much all day lectures. Uh, and then uh, just hang out with people that come, people come from all the world. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think it's phenomenal. And I'm going to hopefully continue to go to it as long as I get accepted. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah, no, I've never done that. <laughs> it sounds like super fun. Yeah. Probably 2009. Or oh, did you? Or something like that. Yeah. Really great. Yeah. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really good. They make the concepts sort of clear and you know, as mentioned, just like these commentaries, you literally have people commentary, comment, like commentating right there and they're arguing right there. And it's really nice to see that. Um, right. just like professionals sort of, I mean, not just like I'm saying they're watching it all, but like, you know, you have like, you know, Anatole Feldman who, you know, really structured sort of equilibrium point. And then you have people sort of asking questions, challenging things. And, and it's really nice to see that dialogue because as a student, you're just like, okay, I see where they're coming from, but I also see where they're coming from. So I'm just going to sit here and listen because I have no idea. What the, <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's, it's really nice to see. Um, and, I, and I think those are more so needed, right? I mean, we're talking about different conferences, Usually it's just like you have 15 minute presentation, you have five minutes of questions, see you later. You know, it's like you can't as a student. And I think of myself and I want to be challenged. I want to be told that I may be wrong and like think about it in different ways. And I think there's got to be a change in how even that is. uh, I mean, it was a bold statement, but even like conferences nowadays, you know, 15 minutes for five minutes of dialogue is not going to really cut cut it right as a student i want i want i'll give a presentation for five minutes but i want to talk and and dialogue for 30 minutes with you or 10 minutes you know so (laughs) it's like that which is yeah i don't know it's something that needs to be sort of looked into i guess yeah 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 i agree i hope i I don't know what we can change the (laughs) the, well who knows what conferences are going to look like anyways after this so um (laughs) Um, and Rajiv, I just want to, I know this is probably not the best time to ask this, but just kind of what kind of what you're working on lately since we uh, 
Right. We talked in the interview. I don't even remember what it was, but it was a while back. So anything new <laughs> yeah. and exciting, probably not right at the moment, but maybe before all of all this. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, so one of the things I'm, I'm currently working on is this um, idea of, of relearning. So basically how you, uh, it's not specific to the rehab context, but just this idea of if you've already got a movement pattern to do a task and then now you're forced to choose an alternative, how well can you adapt to that new way of of doing things so that's that's something i'm looking at uh, both in terms of what factors influence how well you can transition but also in sort of individual differences of can you tell from baseline performance who might sort mm-hmm. of adapt better uh, than others so that's that's one thing i'm working on the other thing you know we, we talked about one little bit is this idea of um this so, sort of standardization of tasks in, in learning motor learning especially Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of getting that this idea of if everybody's doing their own thing, it's going to be really hard for us to sort of collapse all those findings into any any neat framework. So trying to figure out what what we can do to sort of improve um, standardization of tasks, so we can say, hey, if you're working on X, then this can be a good task. Yeah. Sort of similar to what you know biologists and neuroscientists they have model organisms. Right? So you you can't just study whatever you when you say. Oh, if I'm studying this particular mechanism, I study yeah the worm, or I study mouse. So yeah. sort of similar to that kind of concept. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a great a great point and great initiative. Uh, you know, motor control. The ones sort of the ones that we do have standardized are things like the key pressing tasks and yeah. really very simple ones. And there's right. something we said for that. They can compare across so many different studies and stuff, but we do want to scale it up a bit <laughs> to your kind of multiple degree of freedom tasks and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but we don't have the consistency there. Unfortunately, we all do <laughs> radically different things. So, but um, yeah, so I think we'll, we'll sign off guys. So er, thank you for everyone listening and we'll uh, end it there. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Thanks for the great discussion, guys. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakeyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Wait.